Um, so welcome everyone to Guy Goodwin, who most of you will know or have heard of, who's going to give the keynote presentation. So I will give you uh, Guy's introduction. Guy has been Chief Executive at the National and Scottish Centres for Social Research since 2016, with experience of leadership roles in statistics and social research over 20 years. He's been responsible for publications on society, social issues and people in a range of policy contexts from population and migration to crime and from tourism to health and well-being. Guy is a data collection expert, a former director of social surveys in the 2011 census analysis phase, and has specialist knowledge in education and demography. His current organization, NatSEN, conducts many of the country's large social surveys and longitudinal studies, including the gold standard British Social Attitudes Survey, which provides a window over time into public attitudes across a full spectrum of issues. And Guy's background is that he studied statistics to post-grad level at the London School of Economics, and he's a fellow of the Academ Academy of Social Sciences and the Royal Statistical Society. And more recently, he was chair of the UK Data Forum and has a strong interest in linking survey and admin data. So welcome, Guy. The floor is yours. Um, Okay, hello everybody, and um, I hope you're having a great day. Um, what a wonderful time to be involved in health studies. And um, I hope you realize quite how important um, you all are at the moment, because we are in a period, aren't we, of significant public health challenges. Um, whether that's, uh, you've been discussing some of the issues today, whether that's with the aging of the population, uh, with our health, healthy life expectancy, uh, with healthy inequalities and some of the multiple disadvantage we're seeing, whether it's with the challenges of obesity, um, people's poor mental health, uh, our well-being, um, our sense, I guess, as we all change to, you know, if we weren't uh, operating at home before different ways of working, different lifestyles, um, it is a, a remarkable time. And of course, then on top of all that, you've got this magnifying, amplifying impact on those issues caused by uh, the current pandemic and alongside a suite of whole new uh, issues from you know, the backlog, the NHS to long COVID, um, the trauma of working long hours on infection wards, um, you know, changes in uh, lifestyle again uh, during this pandemic. Uh, it really is a challenging time. So it's a, a fantastic time to be a health researcher or, or indeed a health policymaker, health user. Um, so you've been discussing some of those issues today. I was asked to come in at the end, really to say a few words against this remarkable backdrop on what I'm observing with um, uh, data collection and in particular uh, social surveys during this pandemic period. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to talk about and uh, uh, for 20 minutes, and um, then we can open things up for questions. And I guess the first thing I, I would say is if I sort of split um, you all, the, the 64 of us, into um, two, very unfairly actually, into two groups, what I would call the traditionalists in terms of uh, social surveys and data collection, and then the modernists. And by traditionalists, I mean those uh, who lean towards uh, being in favor of a traditional census, who are rather enthusiasts around the sur survey and the social survey, rather like face-to-face -face interviewing, and believe that the uh, data collection methods we've been using largely over the last 50 or more years uh, uh, you know, both sensible, uh, but also uh, pretty relevant today. Um, uh, and then if I call the modernists, uh, people a bit like me, although of course the whole thing's a spectrum, a continuum, and, and it's a bit unfair to group us, but if I call the modernists people who feel society has changed a fair amount, that believe that we have to look differently uh, at our data collection methods as people live their lives differently, more online and so on, who worry about falling response rates um, when perhaps we ought to focus more on bias, are attracted to multi-mode survey approaches, um, rather like the idea of using administrative data 
uh, let's not collect data twice and uh, see great opportunities in so-called big data, sort of unstructured or less structured data, um, uh, bucket loads of it, and who want to use the power of technology to harness, to mine all of that data for the benefit of society and to plonk it on uh, our policy makers tables in real time rather than a year or two after the event. So it's a crude way of defining us, I guess, as traditionalists and modernists, but we probably see ourselves on a continuum, all of us, in, in that. And I guess when face-to-face -face interviewing paused and we all stopped doing it at March 2020 with the pandemic, many of us inevitably asked the question, is this really the turning point for social surveys? Is this when administrative and big data really come to the fore? Is this when we move to multi-mode survey approaches for good and face-to-face um, -face interviewing is binned or becomes much more marginal and no longer necessary or practical? And the answer to that question, I guess, is going to almost certainly be a resounding no, um, or at least that is how I see it. As we approach the end game of the pandemic, I sense traditionalists are pretty upbeat about things. Um, and uh, right now, and it's probable face-to-face -face interviewing will be returning uh, for most of at least the complex national surveys, including the health ones, they're queued up waiting patiently, commissioners. And um, there's even advocacy, isn't there, for a traditional uh, census in five years time, not uh, 10. Uh, the need for longitudinal studies seems to have become greater, not less during the pandemic. Uh, and no doubt, I think that will uh, continue after it. Um, I mean, did you see that wonderful word cloud um, that showed the estimates of the number of COVID-19 cases, including asymptotic cases in the UK, using social media data? Well, no, nor did I, if I'm being honest. Um, and whatever our individual beliefs and preferences might be for the future, I think today we should inevitably look at how we have actually acted in this pandemic and be prepared to turn to the evidence uh, on what that pandemic experience tells us. And I guess when the numbers and trends in infection cases became so important and grew uh, so much higher, where did we as a community turn to? And, and primarily, we turned to um, the ONS COVID-19 infection study, CIS, as some people call it, which is effectively a great whopping national survey of the population conducted face to face. And the reason we did it, of course, is we needed to be pretty sure as, or as sure as we could be of where the numbers and the trends uh, were. And although it sits alongside other studies, including, of course, the REACT study, the um, administrative data that we produce daily, so on, and we look at the suite of measures, um, it is very noticeable that the National, Statist National Statistician made that decision, I believe, correctly um, uh, in uh, uh, deciding that's how we were going to play things. Uh, yes, it's been used alongside other sources, including administrative data. But guess what? I mean, those administrative data don't collect asymptotic cases. We have had to refine uh, definitions as we've gone along, um, such as the number of deaths of people within 28 days of the first positive test. Um, and the data even increase uh, when we do more testing in affected areas. Um, again, amplifying, uh, magnifying uh, potential uh, change. Uh, and those that have experience of administrative data, including many in, in, uh, at this conference uh, listening today, know full well the trial and tribulations of doing so, the comprehensiveness of GP lists, the fact that, you know, one uh, guidance notes going out to police forces uh, giving uh, 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 instructions can affect your crime survey, uh, your, your recorded crime data, or the consequences of departmental staff illnesses on weekly recording of, of say, national insurance numbers 
of the foreign born. So um, we, we understand the deficiencies of the Ministry of Data. And of course, you fully understand it in health. I mean, GPs don't know how many of us have poor mental health from their sources. Um, they look at uh, survey sources. Uh, and that's because it's not all diagnosed and is being handled in a variety of ways by families, schools, and so on. Do GPs really know how many of us are obese or overweight uh, from their um, uh, uh, people going to GP surgeries? Uh, not a chance at the moment is the reality. And so uh, uh, you in health studies, of course, realize uh, some of these issues. Perhaps more interestingly though, it is, um, it's fascinating, I think, that o where ONS has turned to when uh, looking for fast turnaround data. Um, you know, are the public going to be compliant with vaccinations? Is our mental health getting worse and so on? Um, and they've turned to surveys as well, haven't they? And take a bow in particular, those of you who work on the Opinions and Lifestyle um, uh, Survey. I mean, what a tremendous job you've done uh, during this period. And it again reinforces that social surveys uh, have other advantages uh, too, in the sense that you can actually tailor things to the precise question you want asked and ask it when you want it. And, um, and more to the point, I guess, the turnaround has been pretty fast, hasn't it? And countering one of the perceived big weaknesses of social surveys, which is slow turnaround. I mean, the other obvious ones being cost and coverage, or at least sample sizes, and whether we can get geographical and subgroup coverage. So um, in some ways, this pandemic period, as we look at it, we started it questioning, I guess, and saying, really, uh, is this almost the turning point in the end? And we coming, hopefully, to the end of the pandemic. And I think what we have seen is many of the sort of data collection method concerns with uh, other alternatives um, uh, being seen and reinforced over this period. So I just chuck out a small number of observations. Um, the amount of innovation on national surveys in adapting during the pandemic has been pretty remarkable and it just goes to show we can do it. And I would love to see that continue into the future. Uh, a lot has happened in collaboration with customers and users and a lot we can be really proud of, you know, as a community. I worry still, though, you know, it was 2003 when I suggested we move the annual population survey to a multi-mode survey when I was at ONS. And, you know, we're almost 20 years on. And have we put in enough investment into data collection methods so we can deliver well enough? Uh, in, in a pandemic or in other scenar uh, scenarios. And I sense we haven't. And I think in my judgment, we need new impetus on methods and its uh, funding in this area. Um, I think there's a question of how well uh, we are doing with our networks and engaging with uh, policymakers, influencers and practitioners. It's a bit mixed. I still think we can do more as a community. We should ask other the question, are we largely talking to ourselves uh, rather than to policymakers and users? I, I always tell a story when I was at Ofsted with um, uh, Chris Woodhead was HMCI in those days and I was his chief statistical advisor, but you, won't you, you weren't supposed to go to the top floor and talk to him really if you were working in statistics. And I, I uh, decided one day I would went up in the lift, went to see him, and I said, I'm your new statistical advisor. And he said, I didn't know I had an old one. But what I learned as from that experience was the afternoon he phoned up wanting some statistics, and then he wanted a questionnaire, and then he wanted help with this and that. So it's a, there's a great opportunity, you know, for us as, uh, uh, as users, as um, uh, producers, as researchers, as statisticians, to really make an impact by being bold, I think, with some of the key influencers. Um, it's interesting to see that the so-called knock to nudge, which is where you knock at the door and quickly uh, back away and, you know, uh, somebody opens the door and you try to persuade them to answer, a quest uh, answer the questionnaire on telephoning or whatever mode, 
has produced pretty solid response rates, actually. Uh, it, it's interesting to me how close they are to the, um, uh, to the normal response rates. But of course, it's only slightly cheaper. I think um, over time, we are going to have to increasingly uh, provide a suite of products to, uh, to commissioners and pick and choose between different modes. Um, and I think certainly if the pandemic keeps going, uh, that will become you know, pretty uh, normal. Um, so really, I think that's a, an important uh, takeaway from the pandemic. Um, I think some of the technological innovations have worked in certain scenarios, some haven't. I mean, video, com uh, video interviewing seems to have worked rather well on some of the longitudinal studies. The British cohort study, I think, trialed it. Um, it hasn't worked so well on the health survey for England and, um, uh, you know, limited interest among participants if telephone interviewing was offered as well. Um, I think we're uh, using it on the European social survey and um, it'd be interesting to see what, ha that, what happens there uh, if there are no alternatives uh, in a PATH-based survey. And some of this work needs to be brought together because we've got some very important health surveys coming up, haven't we? We've got um, NatCell next year, the, the Sexual Attitudes and Behaviours Survey. We've got the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity uh, Survey coming up, and we really do need to be able to do these surveys um, in whatever context we're, uh, we are facing. Um, the pandemic, I think, has shown the real importance of surveys. I mean, the Mental Health of Children and Young People Survey, um, our longitudinal studies like under Understanding Society being analysed. It's great to see some of the work academics and others have done uh, analysing some of our data sets. The PPE studies, the Opinions and Lifestyles uh, survey I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I think it, it, the relevance of surveys has come across, but I think that relevance does depend on us increasingly, even though social data look are not like stock market data, are they? I mean, they uh, don't need to be in real time, often annually will, will do. But, you know, we really do need to turn these data around faster than we have in the past. I, I think the days of 18 months or two years waiting for survey data are very limited. Um, the most of the methodological challenges and weaknesses we know about social surveys have been proved over this pandemic. Uh, you know, the absence of good quality sampling frames, uh, poorer or differences in response rates, mode effects and so on. Uh, we can see um, uh, differential response rates. Uh, so on the English Housing Survey, for example, we can see we're getting more homeowners and fewer renters uh, during this pandemic period. You can see some of those biases arising. I mean, they can be corrected potentially, um, but samples become less efficient and our job becomes a little bit more difficult. It doesn't seem to be any easier to focus on harder to reach groups to participate in the studies at the moment. Um, so a whole load of evidence is emerging, which you can bring together, of course, over time uh, uh, to, to sort of take a stock take almost of where we are on data collection. But my overall feeling is that the survey is going to come out bouncing out of this pretty well, actually, uh, in comparison to some of the other methods, which really um, have some way to go yet until we uh, get them to where we, we want. Finally, and just to conclude, um, good policy making is, is essential in a democracy. And, and I believe the work you do, I mean, social research statistics really does have the power um, to make life better. I mean, health is the big, big example of this at the moment. Um, you're therefore very important people. I think you have a duty in the coming months and years to really argue and make the business cases, uh, the cost benefit analyses and so on in the coming years so that our policy colleagues succeed in not just addressing the pandemic, but the whole very bold government agenda around leveling up. And I think there are big challenges in health there, um, including data collection. You know, we need mental health data more regularly 
than we get them at the moment. Uh, every seven years won't do, I don't think, uh, as we move forward. So please leave today with excitement, renewed momentum on the importance of your studies, your health research and uh, data collections now and in the future. And, and thank you all, of course, for coming to the conference today. I mean, the UK data service is a wonderful uh, thing in the UK, and it's great to see you all here uh, today. Thank you.